Wow. <laughs> this is really special. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. It means a lot to receive this from your hands. You always understood the value of the historians and the preservationists in this town. You came to our events at Cultural Tourism DC. Um, I would give you a script and you would stand up there and say about three sentences and then you would go on and make the speech that I would have written for you <laughs> from your heart uh, that was always so affirming and so special. So thank you for that. You even belonged, believed in my crazy call box idea, so I'm going to talk more about that later too. You'd stand in the crowd and say, Kathy, where are the call boxes? Do you remember that? <laughs> um, yeah. When thanks to the Historical Society, um, this is a, a real honor and I'm touched. Um, and uh, John, what a pleasure it is, where are you, to, um, you've gone away, yeah, John. Uh, to be here as you begin another chapter in the history of this important organization, now 120 years old. Uh, as you said in John Kelly's article a few weeks ago, it's time for reinvention, for new partnerships, and for more work in the community. Uh, well, I know you're also committed to continuing the heart and soul of the organization, which is the library and the publications. Um, and speaking of that, this is a great issue. And as one who started this with Jane Levy, where are you? With our, thank you, with our, our ruler and our pencil and our proportion wheel. Um, this is a long way from that, and it's fantastic. So thanks to everybody who did this. Um, they've given me 20 minutes, so I just don't want you to know that I'm going to go on long. I hope you can find a seat if you need one. Uh, I guarantee not longer. So here we go. Uh, friends and colleagues in this room, um, I am just overwhelmed by this turnout and by seeing you. I don't have nearly enough time to talk to each of you, so I hope we can keep in touch because this means so much to me. Uh, and Sam, thanks to you. I don't know where you are. We've been a team for almost 48 years. We even wrote a DC musical together way back for John Eaton's school. Too much to uh, talk about tonight, but ask him about it. He wrote the words and the music, I wrote the narrative. So we've been working together a long time. Sam's written about Washington in the present and the future, and I've been working with Washington in the past, and every once in a while we run into each other in the middle. Um, and that was fun too. Um, so this honor, Sam, where, where are you? It's for you too. I couldn't have done this without you. So preparing for this evening, I got to thinking about when I experienced history making magic uh, for people, for organizations, for communities, making connections that moved and even changed people. History can do that, and history close to home can be most powerful of all, and maybe my memories we'll have some useful ideas for the future. Maybe even visionary, which my award says. Very, I love it. <laughs> so um, here's what stands out. I think of students who saw themselves differently as they learned not just to memorize history from a book, but to do history with the kind of primary sources close to hand when you're researching local history. The DC history curriculum of the 1970s did that. It was an NEH funded program for three years. $350,000, it was a real uh, boon to the historic study, uh, to, the, um, to the public schools. I remember a ninth grader um, who wrote the first history of the Reno community, demolished in the 1930s with oral history and local sources, no Wikipedia. She knew she'd learned to be a historian. And then I remember the average student at Evans Junior High in far northeast learning about DC history and architecture who with great pride made this model of her public housing unit complete with clotheslines. Then she interviewed longtime residents about their lives there. History didn't have to be about famous people. Architecture didn't have to be grand to be important. Her teacher was amazed and the student became a better student. Uh, I think of all the people involved with me in the NEH funded three year DC history curriculum project, Bob Berg and Sandy Fitzpatrick at the start. Jim Flack, who's here, one of the academic historians teamed with ninth grade teachers. Betty Ann Kane, who supported the project on the school board and later the city council. 
Um, and there's the first text. Here's the second one done by Keith Melder. Uh, that's Hiram Graham who published the books. Um, and he's here tonight. <clears throat> Um, this DC history course was in place from 1983 until 2010 as a ninth grade requirement in the DC public schools and I talked to somebody here tonight whose student loved it, Julie. Um, it's been replaced by a few weeks in the junior and senior year. Too late, too little. Teachers are already calling the Historical Society for help. We need some new visions here. Hiram's here. Ask about this book because um, it's wonderful, and it needs some better circulation. And we have it up in the library. Um, I don't have a picture of this one, but this is a project about church archivists from all over the city, east and west of the park, black and white, well-to-do and not so, meeting monthly for two years at this historical society on how to deal with common problems. They came from such different backgrounds, but they had the same issues how to find better space than the boiler room for the church archives, whether to keep the old checks, how to do an exhibit without sticking pins in the pictures. Differences between us dissolved. This project helped the societies that began to reach a much more diverse staff, board, and membership. Teresa Grana is here tonight, and she was really important to this, as so many things in the early society. We never did get to use this model with small businesses, organizations, and individuals who wanted to learn how to preserve their archives in place. Um, so maybe there's some ideas here, perhaps. Now, this picture, I remember members of this historical society welcoming Pierre L'Enfant back to the city after 200 years in 1991 in an unlikely setting at Georgetown Park. The planner had had his first meeting with local people across the street. Actually, at the time, it had become the pleasure chest, if any of you know about that. <laughs> people, uh, we charged $17.91, and people poured in the door, hundreds of them. We were stunned. There was Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly, Congresswoman Ellen Holmes Norton, and the French ambassador under our banner. Don Hawkins was Pierre, who preferred, we learned later, to be called Peter. Um, and uh, Judge Ro Quander was our Benjamin Banneker. We created some pageantry around our iconic local figures, played games with copies of early city maps, raised our visibility in the city with government officials, and generally stepped out of the traditional mold of a historical society. We had a great time. How about bringing back Boss Shepherd? Uh, good idea. Oh, yes, and we kept on dressing up for parties, and we did it by the decades. Pi, there you are. Uh, and Mr. Kiplinger, I'm sorry to break your cover, but you look great in that hat. And how can we ever thank you for all you and your family have done for this historical society? In the 1990s, I had a life-changing experience working as a consultant to the Thurgood Marshall Center for Service and Heritage. We were creating a heritage center in the restored 12th Street YMCA just south of U Street. Uh, here's the building restored. The oldest standing YMCA built for African Americans in the nation. And here is the lobby as it looked in 1913. We talked to community elders about what they would like to say in this Heritage Center about their experience living in a segregated city. They were 70 and 80s years old. These are the elders talking about what they would like to say. Um, I've never heard a more powerful experience of a sense of shared community, pride, and overcoming adversity with strength. I heard a huge commitment to education and to caring for one another that I have never seen equaled. One participant emotionally spoke of the pivotal importance of her junior high math teacher. There was a silence for a bit, and then a person across the room said, that was my mother. I can't do justice to this in a few minutes. My deep thanks to Myra McWhorter and so many others who welcomed me into a community not my own and shared their stories with me. And Ibrahim Mugman, you are one of them, and you're here tonight. Based on these memories, the Thurgood Marshall Center teamed up with this historical society and Metro to sponsor a unique project. 
we created a 160-foot-long exhibit on a metro construction fence outside in the 1300 block of U Street. It was called Remembering U Street. It featured quotes from the elders that you just saw and photographs from their personal collections, like those. Duke Ellington playing the Howard. And the dozen, picture from 1912, both given to us by participants. We feared for graffiti, so we decided um, with the help of artist Julie Dickerson and a young rap artist and sculptor, Terrence Nicholson, to make it look like graffiti from the start. It was up for two and a half years and it went almost untouched. People who would never have gone inside a museum looked at it day and night. I spoke to a man entranced with a picture of Sarah Vaughan playing a local club. I was there, he told me. I washed dishes in the kitchen, and I, I heard her. A new resident, white, said to me, this is my story too now. A troubled man who wandered the streets and talked to himself became calm and engaged while studying the exhibit. This exhibit never got any publicity. It wasn't what you were supposed to do in Washington. It was one of the best things I was ever part of. It made magic on the street, and sometimes quirky really works. There's our team. More powerful experiences came with work with the DC Heritage Tourism Coalition, later called Cultural Tourism DC. It was created by this historical society and the DC Humanities Council. The idea, part of a national initiative, was to have historic sites and cultural institutions partner with the traditional marketers of cities, the convention centers, hotels, and restaurants, to present American cities as cultural destinations like Europe. In DC, we added another dimension, making the rich history of our local city beyond the monuments more visible. And along with the treasures on the National Mall, making the whole city a cultural destination, we had upwards of 200 members, historic sites and cultural centers, created new visitor experiences. We intended to bring more of the millions of visitors on the mall into the city to learn more about it as a great American city as well as the capital, and to bring some of their dollars with them. Steve Schulman is in charge of Cultural Tourism DC now, and it's great to have you here. Where are you? There, Steve. Um, Tony. Uh, the fact that you and your administration supported this effort had everything to do with its success. Um, we had a great uh, party at the convention center, I don't know if you remember, and we lined everybody up and gave them a copy of um, Capital Assets and got this great picture. There's Judith Lanius, who was my first chair, and I think you'll recognize um, the others there. Um, you understood, you and your team, what we were trying to do, and as you said, Tersh Bosberg, where are you? You uh, were in there paving the way, thank you. And Julie Rogers, you and the Meyer Foundation were absolutely pivotal in making this work, because most foundations didn't get that we had culture here, and then we had some commercial connections, and there were different people that did that at different places, and Julie said, I get it and you convened your partners and it meant everything, so thank you. Julie is about to retire after 28 years as chair of the Meyer Foundation. And my dear friend, thank you. And you've meant so much to this historical society too. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, so I think you're all most familiar with the Heritage Trails, which have become the organization's flagship. But another magic story here is what happens when just the right partnerships with unlikely collaborators happen. The impossible becomes possible. Lou Dolly, head of the convention center, is building this new one. He got it. He wanted neighborhood information for the new convention center. He sponsored our first neighborhood walk day in 2000 with an amazing group of partners, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Metro, and the Historical Society, and the Convention Center. We mixed it up with music in the streets. Here are the doo-wop cops at 7th and Indiana. Uh, actually, Starbucks was so excited. We had a huge crowd that you can't see. Starbucks came out with things on trays because um, they just they loved it. It was serendipity. And this event kicked off 
um, the blossoming of walking tours in the city. Steve Coleman. The Chamber of Commerce sponsored tours that we wrote for Gray Line that went to Anacostia. That was a first. They went to U Street and Georgetown. Gray Line was surprised. Hotels and restaurants became partners in themed citywide celebrations keyed to major museum exhibits. The first was Jackie Kennedy at the Corcoran Gallery. More than 60 cultural tourism members created themed events. One restaurant offered dessert in the shape of a pillbox hat on Jackie's birthday. <laughs> a restauranter told me later how excited and surprised and pleased he was to be asked to be involved with a group of cultural institutions. And to our amazement, Deb Ziska at the National Gallery of Art stepped up the next year and said, let's do it with our James Bearden exhibit. It was their first one-man show of an African-American artist at the National Gallery. Here was a real national local collaboration that linked the National Mall with the rich African-American history of U Street. Unlikely partnerships make the impossible possible. I mentioned a key for cultural tourism DC was making local history and culture more accessible. This city has a powerful African-American history, but it wasn't being told. If you sent visitors to U Street in 1995, they had no way to find or experience it. How could we work with the community to make it visible? We convened community leaders in the neighborhood and they wanted to do it. The first heritage trail was planned for Shaw. Then there were regular walking tours every Saturday. This says before Harlem, there was U Street. We figured 1910, the Howard Theater. Um, we often brought tours to Ben's Chili Bowl. Uh, here's a group from Europe. I think they are the Marshall Scholars. Do you remember maybe them coming here uh, as part of your administration? Uh, and then um, that day we had a special speaker. Do I have to introduce Mark Plotkin? <laughs> and now Ben's Chili Bowl has created the neighborhood visitor center that we dreamed about. Thanks to the Ali family, another great partner in Virginia is here too. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> the downtown DC business improvement district saw what was going on in Shaw and signed on for a trail down, downtown. Thanks again, Tony, for being there and for the essential backing of your Department of Transportation for these trails. Um, we went to see the head of DDOT, Dan Tangerlini, and I got, I got three minutes into my pitch about why we should do these trails, and he said, stop. And I said, oh, we're done. He said, I'm from Boston. I know the Freedom Trail. Let's do it. That's what happened. Um, the idea for the trails actually came from a, a trail I saw in Lower Manhattan in the late 1990s. Here are some downtown banners that the bid put up um, in honor of those trails. Only the first three were done on my watch, but Jane Levy took this on and fully realized my dream for this project, engaging neighborhood residents fully in doing the research and developing the story of their place. I know this process has made magic happen for people who are working together to explore the history of their communities. Soon there will be 17 trails around the city. Jane, thank you. <laughs> Woo! Um, I'm ending with the police and fire call boxes. <laughs> One of the craziest things I ever thought of. There are 800 of them in the city. I, I signed a piece of paper that said we would take all of them. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to do about that. Uh, there's Calorama, and there's DuPont Circle. Well, what happened is the city ended up cleaning all of them for us, because I didn't know how I was going to get that done. But I think they figured instead of taking them all out, they weighed like 3,000 tons apiece. Um, pounds, maybe not tons. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I, I thought they could become neighborhood icons with artists and historians working together. Actually, Sam named this. He's a good namer. He called it Art on Call. In Mount Pleasant, a sculptor, Michael Ross, spent a year doing miniature bronze sculptures for each of 11 boxes. When we unveiled them, an official from the fire department came up and said, I grew up in this neighborhood. 
He was sort of teary. He said, I love this. Thank you. And then the representative of the police department came up and said, do you know what I have in this shirt pocket? I said, no. He pulled out a key. He said, this is my call box key. I have carried it since the 1970s when we stopped using these boxes. Thank you for doing this. This is what I mean about magic. Um, and then I learned that the first winter, some residents knitted miniature hats and scarves for the characters in these Mount Pleasant boxes. So I want to tell you there are more boxes out there. They're not all done. Um, I know from personal experience, many visitors found their way off the mall and into the city. I don't think it's an accident that the Washington Convention and Visitors Association, and there are people here tonight from there, so I hope this is okay to say, changed its name to Destination DC in 2008 to reflect, according to its website, its increased emphasis on the city's unique assets, which is exactly what we were trying to do. And our local attractions are there on the site, along with a strong emphasis on the city's powerful black heritage, which hadn't been there before. But perhaps more important, um, Cultural Tourism DC may have helped people here in the city appreciate and care for the communities that make this city unique, connect them to their neighbors, enrich their lives as Washingtonians. Um, while many organizations in this city are now engaged in saving and in promoting the unique history of the city, the Historical Society of Washington, D.C. continues to have a unique role. It's the only one whose mission straddles and combines all the pieces, collecting, preserving, and teaching. An outstanding library, the only journal devoted to new D.C. scholarship, public programs for schools, children, and the general public. It has a great position from which to build partnerships and a great bully pulpit to promote the need to save and understand the history of this great city. The experiences you have given me the opportunity to remember tonight lead me to say how important it is to continue to build the library, promote scholarship, publish the journal, but also mix the generations, provide opportunities for people to tell their stories to others unlike them, build unusual alliances, work across the divides the city has of race and ethnicity, local and federal, east and west of the river, and now newcomers and old timers. Link history with music, like tonight. Take it to the streets. Do some pageantry around local heroes. Help kids do history. Be a little quirky. Make it magic. I have a little more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And how could I not just mention Washington at home? Thanks to my authors who are here tonight. Oh, there they are. I love that project. This is shameless promotion. If you don't have the book, buy it. Buy it for your friends. Buy a lot. I don't know how, many, how, how that many people could have possibly done one book. But we did. <laughs> we did. Um, and um, I hope people like it. So I'm in Maine now. What am I doing? Well, I'm on the Maine Historical Society. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also creating a history of a historic farm on a hay wagon pulled by a tractor. Uh, so it seems to be in the genes. Uh, I am so thrilled and humbled um, to be honored by the Historical Society. It's been my life since the 1970s. So thank you, and thanks to so many in this room for being my inspired colleagues and dear friends. I wish I could call out every one of you. If I haven't, please know I love you and appreciate you. So happy birthday, and Godspeed to this Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you.